Okay, so tonight's class is going to be a class about um, Purim. Tonight being Rosh Chodesh. I want to wish everyone Chodesh Tov Mubarak. And <clears throat> tonight's class is a bit of a different type of class. I want to talk about Megillat Esther from a bit of a different angle. Um, I, I touched upon this earlier on this week on uh, Wednesday morning, Mario was there. Uh, we, we literally just uh, began the opening of the topic. I want to expand a little bit on it and, you know, bring some real discussion into Megillah to, into, into the Megillah today. So the way we opened up then <coughs> was a um, discussion on the current crisis with uh, Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, there was an overarching discussion whereby, you know, obviously not uh, using this purely as an example, but just to kind of um, trying to understand where we're going with this. So let's start with this. When your wife really, you know, makes a mistake, messes up, how do you tell her off? Do you, do you tell her off? Or do you diplomatically avoid insulting her? Yeah, I know the reality is that husbands who avoid mentioning their wives' uh, uh, weight gain usually live longer than those who speak out. <coughs> you know, a classic example of this is uh, Viktor Frankl. In his book, Man's Social Meaning, uh, he points out that he was very nice to the concentration guards, uh, the, the guards in the camp. Um, and, you know, was he wrong? Should he have just spoken up the truth? And whether, although there was power, but he could have protested, you know, the brutal Holocaust, the brutal way they were treating people. Uh, so there really is a very... Uh, broad scope to this discussion and if you want to title it maybe principle versus survival what's more important do you stand by your principles or do you keep with survival you know one of the classics perhaps is is what's happening right now you know we spoke about on, on Wednesday Israel's position kind of a bit of a, a difficult position between a rock and a hard place uh, Russia allows Israel to bomb Syria, um, and then uh, on the other hand, there are, there are Jews in both Russia and Ukraine um, who are being targeted, who are being uh, who who are having a very difficult time right now. So this is really a discussion. Also, you know, from every level, any any leadership position is going to have this crisis. And, you know, do you stick to your values or do you kind of bend when there's a bigger picture? You know, survival almost. Why do I want to talk about this? Because it's very relevant to understanding the undercurrent of the Megillah. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, <clears throat> There we go. Okay. So I want to go through the two two of the main characters of Megillah of the Megillah, um, and maybe we can kind of just open it up to, to discussion and, and really try and analyze a little bit to see if there is perhaps a different perspective than what we always understood. One of the um, challenges what I like to do in these classes are, you know, to challenge the way we've always thought and to bring perhaps either a different perspective or even just to open up the concept as a question to open ourselves to new ideas and to broader horizons. So I want to talk about two people today. Two, two of the main characters is Mordecai and Esther. 
Mordechai and Esther are known as the heroes of Megillat Esther. And I want to kind of challenge that. So here we go. We've got, what do we know about Mordechai in his position? So just a bit of background. Mordechai was one of the members of the Sanhedrin. Um, Mordechai was a, a very great Tamit Chacham. One of the reasons why he knew the whole story of Bitan and Teresh was because of uh, his knowledge of the 70 languages, being one of the members of the Sanhedrin. And uh, very well respected Gadol Hador, one of the leaders of the generation. And Mordechai did something which put the rest of the Jewish people in peril. So we tend to look at Mordechai as the hero, the one who saved the entire Jewish nation from Haman's uh, abusive uh, uh, role in the whole Purim story, ultimately leading to his demise, <clears throat> and to Van Ha'apochu, where the whole Purim story gets turned around, and the Jewish people get saved. But let's look at actually what happened in the Megillah. Let's see if we can analyze what this looks like from you know, Mordechai's perspective. So Pasuk in uh, Megillah Tester, Chapter 3, Pasuk Alas. Achara de Vermaele, after some time. Gidal Amelech Hashur Shaman bin Amadat Agari. So it was after the period where Vashti had been killed. And now Achashverosh goes ahead and promotes Haman, the wicked Haman. And he puts his seat greater than any of, of the, other, the other officials. He becomes essentially the prime minister, the second in command, the most second most powerful person in, in Persia, or in the 127 provinces which Ahasuerus was king over. <clears throat> Pretty much was most of the world at the time. And all the king's, uh, you know, courtiers in the palace, skate, all bow down and kneel to Haman. Why? Because this is what the king actually ordered. Part of the kavod for the king, part of the honor for the king, was that you honor my servant, you honor my officer. However, Mordechai would not kneel or bow. Okay, so Mordechai is immediately placing himself in a position whereby he is now uh, not going to do what everyone else is doing. Not only he's not going to do what everyone else is doing, but also he's basically defying the king. Next pasuk. And the people in the king's courtiers who were in the palace gate said to Mordechai, Why are you disobey the king's orders? Why are you not bowing to Haman? What's going on? And every day they're telling him the same thing. And they tell Haman in order to see whether Mordechai's resolve would prevail. For he had explained to them that he was a Jew. Essentially put, I mean, even the simplistic wording of the Pasuk is a little bit difficult, but simply put, Mordechai kind of made it very clear he's not bowing down. And what he does is, he tells them, the reason why I'm not bowing down is because I'm Jewish. So they go up to Haman, they tell him, did you notice that Mordechai is actually not bowing down. And they put him in this awkward position until he actually confronts Mordechai. And he sees that Mordechai is literally not bowing down to him. Why? Because he told them that he's Jewish. Okay, very interesting way of putting it. But the immediate question which, you know, the immediate comment which kind of comes up is Mordechai is jeopardizing the entire Jewish people. As a result, we know that Haman gets so angry that he decides he's going to take out the, his wrath of Mordechai, not only on Mordechai, but also on all men, women, and children 
in the entire um, in the entire kingdom, which is kind of wild. So what is going on over here? So Mordechai is, is taking on a position where he's jeopardizing everybody else's lives. Why? For a principle. I believe this is the right thing to do. And it doesn't matter what the ramifications are. This is what has to be done. That's what seems to be from the simplistic text of the Megillah. So does anyone, by the way, have a, a different reading of the text before we move on? Okay. So it seems to be quite straightforward. Mordechai is taking this like stand literally that whatever the weather, whatever the price, I am not bowing down to Ahmad. Could be at his own personal, um, uh, jeopardizing his own personal position and jeopardizing the entire Jewish nation. The arch anti Semite, who's ultimately in power right now, hates his guts and is prepared to kill everyone as a result. Very interesting perspective. We talk about heroes, wondering if that is very heroic. Do we have any? sources of such a thing, or does the Torah tell us about being heroic on somebody else's back? Being heroic and how far do we stand for our values and when do you bend for survival? There's no greater survival seemingly in this story than ensuring the survival of the Jewish people by not antagonizing you know, the Jewish people's art enemy who's, by the way, got a history of... Uh, being antagonistic to Jewish people. You know, his grandfather was, he's, he's a descendant of Agag. Agag was uh, from Amalek. This is, this is the real deal. So what is Mordechai doing? So I mentioned on Wednesday uh, very briefly, but I want to bring it to you inside over here. The Midrash in Esther Abba kind of fills in a lot of the holes within the story of Megillah Tester. It's fascinating that throughout the story of Megillah Tester, there's a lot of pieces which we don't know much about. Um, it's actually really important to understand that the whole story of Megillat Esther took place over uh, a very long period of time. So from the beginning of the miracle of Purim, or the beginning of the Ahasuerus' reign, uh, to the very end, we're talking about approximately a period of over nine years. And, you know, I mentioned this last year, when you look at it as a string of coincidences, it really doesn't, you know, flow very well. But then you patch it all together, and that's one of the, the uh, main parts of the Purim story, is to look at the miracle and the message of the Book of Esther is to piece everything together from nine years ago till today, and look where we were and look where we are today. Where the change happened, how the change happened, what made it, what didn't do it, what was the cause? And if you look through the whole story and you look through the ups and downs, Haman gets pushed up to be killed. He builds a gallows for Mordechai, to, for Mordechai and he gets hung on it himself. Vashti gets killed, Esther gets put in. There's so many multiple different layers and that's really the Purim story in a nutshell. But the truth is, if you just look at it as a story simplistically, it, it's kind of hard to figure out without the commentators, without the Medrashim, exactly what happened because there's so many pieces missing, which we don't have much insight to if you don't look at the different understandings of the way Chachamim, you know, explain it. So Esther Rabbah, uh, one of the most uh, 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 noteworthy Medrashim, as follows, says as follows. <clears throat> Ishi Yehudi Hayab Shanabira. You know, the first, uh, uh, one of the first Tukim in chapter two, one of the psukim we actually read aloud as at Sibur when we read together, one of the few psukim we read aloud together. Ish Yehudi, there was a Jewish man, a Judean. And the Midrash says, and that's Mordechai, he's referred to Ish Yehudi. Says the Midrash, Lama ni Yehudi, why is he referred to as a Judean? He was seemingly from the tribe of Binyamin. Says the Midrash, this source too. Afish Yichet Shemosh Lakadosh Baruch Hu Knegat Kol Ba'olam. Because he unified the name of the Holy One, blessed is he, before all creatures of the world. 
הדעה עוד הכתיב, לא יכרע ולא ישתחווה. That's what the pasuk says, and Mordechai would not bow and would not prostrate himself. Asa Midrash, וכי קנטרן היה ועובר על גזרת המלך? Was he contrary and violating the king's decree? Was he kind of like an antagonist? אלא כשצבא אחשוורש להשתחוות להמן, says the Midrash. When Achashverosh commanded everyone to prostrate themselves to Haman, Chakak Avodat Kuchavim Alibo. Haman decided he's going to go one step further and he carved an idol and set it over his heart. And what does he do? He walks around with this. And he um, intends that when people bow down to him, they're actually going to bow down to the idol as well. So what happens? So this plan is not working apparently for this guy called Mordechai. He's very angry. Mordechai says to him, there is a master who exalts over all the exalted. How can I forsake him and prostrate myself to an idol? And because he unified the name of the Holy One, he is called Judean, meaning by himself, Yechidi, alone. Okay, so we have some sort of explanation, according to the Midrash, why Mordechai is actually not bowing down to Haman. What is that? Well, simply put, Haman puts an idol on his uh, chest, whatever it is, and uh, Mordechai sees this. We know you're not allowed to bow down to idols. Boom. We know there's three cardinal sins which a person has to be killed for. What are they? Are oh, well, those idol worship? A person tells you, bow down to this idol or I'll kill you. A person has to be killed. Or shvichut tamim. A person says, kill this person or I'll kill you. A person has to let them still be killed. And finally, gilu uh, arayot, which is um, um, cohabiting with a forbidden uh, somebody, who, one of the, the sexual partners who a person is forbidden to cohabit with. So one of those three things seemingly is Avodah Zarah. And if you look at it simply according to the Midrash, it kind of all makes sense. You, Mordechai, the hero, is a real Jew, real Yehudi, literally. He is standing up for values. He's standing up for anti-Semitism. He's standing up for everything Jews hold dear. Halakha dictates that you're supposed to do such a thing and take such a position. What do you mean? Everybody else is going to, going to jeopardize the rest of the Jewish people? Yeah, but that's the halakha. So really, it kind of all works out. But if you look at the overall understanding of the Psukim, it doesn't have any indication that this is what's happening. In fact, there are other Midrashim which talk about how Mordechai says, my great-grandfather didn't bow down to his uh, antagonist, you know, Yaakov to Esav, so I'm also not going to bow down. Um, Oh, it's been Yamin because he wasn't born yet. So he didn't bow down. So I'm not going to bow down. It sounds, it sounds almost like Mordechai doesn't have this, you know, religious element to the whole not bowing down to Haman piece. Rather, there's, there's something else over here, which he wants to stand by his principle on the back of everybody else. And that sounds also very difficult kind of stomach because we know the ramifications. Okay, so that's, that's Mordechai. We'll, we'll, get, we'll swim back to that um, as we get along. I want to take a moment to talk about the other hero we touched on. The other hero who actually co-authored the reading, the, the Megillah, was none other than Esther. Esther, a quiet girl who gets uh, abducted and forced to marry the king. And uh, ultimately... She, she has to give up everything she had until now. She was married to Mordechai, according to the Gemara. And now she can no longer go back to her husband because she's going willingly to her, uh, to, to the king to, to be with. And ultimately, she would never be able to return back to her husband. I mean, until now, she was forced. So there was always an argument. A person is forced, it's not their fault. But once she was going willingly to Hashverosh, ultimately to save the Jewish people, that was it. That was, she was kind of doomed. So, you know, the, the famous hero of Megillat Esther, 
unfortunately it doesn't have a very happy ending that's that's the part which you know we don't hear about very often but Esther was kind of succumbed to her fate in order to save the Jewish people that being said Mordechai and Esther we know Megillat Esther is called Megillat Esther one of the 24 books of Tanakh you know really a, an incredible feat which she was able to do uh, to kind of get this already after the Beth Midash, it wasn't even there in Israel, and they were able to make it, if you will, into one of the 24 books, one of the 24 holy books. So Mordechai and Esther are two very great people. We know them as heroes. Have a look at this Gemara. The Gemara in Megillah says as follows. Megillah Zayn Amud Aleph 7a says as follows. Amar of Shmuel Barihuda. Shmuel Barihuda says, Shalchalaim Esther lechachamim. Esther requested that the observance of Purim and the reading of Megillah be instituted as an ordinance for all generations. She says, don't only do it for now. I want Megillah to stay to be read for generations, forever. Okay. Interesting, uh, you know, request. Shalchula, so they write back to her. What are you doing? Don't forget, you know, they killed the ten sons of Haman. They wiped out hundreds of people. Uh, there was two days of fighting in Shushan. You know, it was really not a very good uh, story for your local anti semite Why would you want to kind of arouse the wrath of your, your uh, local anti semite Seemingly, it would be inappropriate to kind of have this down for generations that people are going to read every year. You just need any guy to pick it up and say, hey, you see these Jews? You see what they do? They just kill people. They just eradicate anybody who's against them. Not a good idea. Shalchalahem, so she sent back to them, Kvar Kutuvani al Malchem for us. What do you mean? I'm already written in the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia. In fact, the very, the second last pasuk in time of Gila is, V'chol ma'aset ha'kol gurato prashak gurot mordechai, asher gidlo ha'melech halohem kituvim, asefer divrei ha'amin malchem adayu for us. So if you want to know all about the promotion of Mordechai and all the different stories which happened, you know, throughout this story, it's recorded in the Book of Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia. Okay, I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of the Chronicles of Media and Persia. I'm not sure if you're gonna, you can look it up in the uh, British Museum, I don't know, or, or something like that, but, uh, or the Persian Museums at least. But Esther seems to be having this kind of very interesting exchange. She says, I want this for generations. The rabbis say, let's not, you know, let sleeping dogs lie. Let's not kind of antagonize the anti-Semites. And she says, no, no, no. If I'm not, if it's, it's, there's no, nothing new which I'm publicizing because it's already out there. It's already in the paper. Where is it? In the Chronicles, Madame Faras, of Media and Persia. Interesting exchange. Now, you would think, that, you know, the, the simplistic way of looking at this is, okay, Esther wants to maybe make a claim to fame. Great story. She's dedicated her life for the, to be the savior of the Jewish people. Um, you know, she wants this recorded. She wants people to remember. So just in terms of breakdown, I mean, how heroic is that? I mean, it's very nice. You, you've done something amazing. But like, at what point does it, you know, get to your head and cloud your judgment? And seemingly, uh, perhaps a little bit more difficult is the rabbis turn around and says, we understand what you want to do, but there's a very strong argument against that. What's the argument? It will arouse some wrath of the local anti-Semites. So she says, no, 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 don't worry about it because it's already publicized. What do you mean it's already publicized? I've never heard of it. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. But I only know this story from Miguel Esther. So seemingly what she's doing over here is doing something which is being chronicled for generations. And we need to kind of try and understand what's Esther thinking, what she's saying. And she needs some sort of answer for the fact that this is going to arouse the wrath of the local anti-Semites or anti-Semites through, through centuries. So if we want to kind of just take a line of Mordechai and Esther, and put those two pieces together, it seems to be that both Mordechai and Esther are taking a very strong stand that, you know what? 
by a hook or by a crook, we want to do this because we believe in this. There's a certain principle which they're trying to get across. And whatever the price is, it's going to arouse anti-Semitism. Well, the, the Jewish people are going to be eradicated. It makes no difference because we believe in this principle. That's what comes out seemingly from just the breakdown of the simple wording of the Megillah and what the Gemara, what the Talmud brings down about Esther. So I'm wondering if anybody's got any comment on that, just in terms of um, is this different to you know, bringing it back to your spouse or your friend? Do we kind of always prop them up, say, this is the principle, this is what I believe in, I'm going for it by hook or by crook? Or, you know, there's a certain survival element where, you know, you're in the concentration camps and you're at the mercy of the Nazi uh, uh, prison guard. If you're nice to him, maybe you'll get an extra piece of uh, peel of potato. Or you're going to tell him, listen, this is, I'm crazy. You're a brutal uh, maniac. You know, where do you draw the line? What seems to be from the Megillah is, no, go for it. You say the truth. And, you know, if there's brutality happening between Russia and Ukraine, I don't care what other ideas you have in your mind to, for, for personal survival, but there's some real uh, uh, inappropriate uh, things happening over here which you have to stand up to. What Mordechai and Esther seem to be doing is, by hook, by crook, I'm standing up for my principle. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, um, excuse me. Recounting the story, I don't know. Does that? I mean, all she's doing is she's telling people um, in the future what has happened, right? She's just account, she's recounting the story. But the I'm not sure. Really have a problem with this, right? The rabbi's not making this up. There, there seems to be like. You know, it's almost the, the way I read it, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, the way I read it is like, should we stick it in your face? That was the discussion. The rabbi say, mm -hmm. don't stick it in the face. It's already put somewhere, very nice. Just leave it, leave it as it is. Esther says, no, I want it for generations. Every Purim, the Jews are gonna come, hit the Gragas, bang Haman, you know, Amalek, wham. Mm -hmm. How do you, how yeah. do you see it? I, 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 that's how I see the, the, the exchange. Do you see it a different way? Yeah, well, I, I don't see it as a choice between, okay, we need to do the right thing versus here, it's, we need to advertise our history. Like we have to, we have to remember and not forget what, was ha what happened to us because if you don't remember history, maybe it, re it could repeat itself. This kind of an idea where Esther is saying, it doesn't matter. We need to keep on, you know, reading this over and over and over because we got to remind ourselves. Maybe it's more for ourselves. And it's not because I, I don't see it again because we're necessarily advertising the bad of what somebody else did. It's more remembering the history so it won't repeat itself for ourselves. I don't know. I, I, I'm still having trouble connecting this to you know, a decision to, de to, to decide between good and evil and just, you know, you got to do good, whatever the consequences, you know, and this, because she's not, uh, how is she doing good here? She's saying for future generations as we continue reading the Megillah. Okay. So what's the big deal? So, okay, so, so let me throw this back on you. First of all, there's an exchange going on over here. The rabbis are having some sort of difficulty with her request. So mm -hmm. clearly, clearly the rabbis are not comfortable with what she's saying. And then but, he has mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, respond to that. That's point number one. Point number yeah. two, um, she is obviously trying to bring over a message. It's not good enough. This is not a historical account, which we just kind of, let's just remember this. Because if there was a historical account, which you need to remember, it's already written. It's, it's recorded somewhere. See, so you, you'll pull it up on the, on the World Wide Web, you know, one day. Um, but that's the thing. No, no, I need this to be recorded because something is happening here or something just happened over here, which later generation needs to, needs to know about. And what is that? Right. But then by that argument, it is already written somewhere. 
right? So the, the reason why we keep on repeating it every year, every year, every year is, uh, is why. is not necessarily because, well, it's so that we don't forget, uh, oh. you know, so that history doesn't repeat ourselves. When, when the rabbi said to them, said to her, look, you got to be careful because you're just going to trigger more anti-Semitism if you just keep on doing this. I don't think, again, it's not her doing necessarily what's right or wrong. It's just a question of, you know, uh, voicing history. Like, well, what has happened? You know, it's not like you're, you're standing up and saying, look, what Russia is doing in Ukraine is wrong. Now, that may have consequences to you by coming up and doing that statement, saying that statement. Here, the right and wrong already happened, right? It was wrong, the Jews were wrong, and that was it. It's history. It's in the past. You're not doing anything necessarily to save the people at the time. It's past, right? I mean, the, the reason why you would, one of the reasons you would stand up today and say, look, something wrong is happening, is because you need to stop that wrong. But in this case, that wrong has already happened. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm having trouble with the two. So you're saying, there's a difference between Mordechai and Esther. Mordechai, it's an active position which he's taking, you know, right or wrong, with ultimate co consequences, as opposed to Esther, just the decision of, you know, taking a stand is not such an extreme decision because, yeah, look, it's a happen already, and it's just a matter of, you know, you know, will it antagonize a little bit? Won't it antagonize a bit? It's not such a big deal like Mordechai. But let's let's. I, I think I I don't know. I'm, I'm... I, I, I hear the argument. I I mean. Mm -hmm. I think clearly what the Gemara is trying to say is there's a message coming over here. And what Esther's uh, giving over is just to have it chronicled as a history lesson is not good enough. There's a message, an uh, 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 underlying message in the Purim story, which I need chronicled for generations, but also to be remembered every year. And that's only by writing this Megillah and people will actually you know, observe Purim and read the Megillah. And the question is what that message is. So even if you want to revert back to the message somewhere, you know, within the context of Mordechai, we can always roll back onto that and say, okay, Mordechai is taking the stand. But is that the right position? Should a person always be standing by his principles or should a person bend? When there obviously are broader consequences. We're not talking about, you know, uh, you know you're going to lose some money over here. We're talking about, you know, life and death consequences. Um, literally a hawk, uh, between a rock and a hard place and what seems to be is if we roll this off the last part where Mordechai is taking the stand by hook by crook and then Esther says I need this message to go over generations that sounds to be a pretty strong statement and the question is you know is that is that a, a broad uh, you, you can use that very broadly is that very specific we saw in the in the Midrash that it was very specific only because of, you know, that what the other I involved, but we suggested that perhaps not. Maybe it's nothing to do with that. Maybe there was a, another piece over here which Mordechai was standing up for. So I saw this idea from someone called Rabbi Rabinowitz um, from Israel. And uh, he suggests the following. I thought it was an interesting uh, piece and I want to share with you. So, we talk about context. You know, whenever you look, whenever you look through the, through Tanakh, there's never a piece of Tanakh which is recorded just for fun. Tanakh is not a history book. In fact, that's what Megillah is trying to say at the very end, to say, listen, if you're looking for history, this ain't the place. Go look for history somewhere else. You want to find history? It's chronicled in other places. Go look there. But in terms of trying to understand what this message is for later generations, the Torah or the Chachamim records very specific psukim. And as we've mentioned so many times through the Rashi classes, that so much of what happens, what we see in other places, Midrashim and the commentators, the Chazal and the, and the Talmud, is not recorded in the Pasuk. And you kind of have to really fish your way out. It's like there's some sort of gematria or remez, whatever it is, which Rashi brings, whatever it is. And it seems to be like really you've got no connection uh, to the real story because it doesn't have any value for us, later generations, 
what we can take out of it. So it's so fundamental to and, and so important to understand that if there's a piece in Tanakh, then that piece is something which we have to take as a lesson. And when Esther says, I need this recorded for later generations, it's because this is a fundamental which we have to study from, which we have to learn from. So what is the backdrop over here? Let's just try and you know, roll back a little bit in terms of history. Where are we at? What period does this happen? Where are the Jewish people at from a political perspective, from a socioeconomic perspective? Um, who are they? So first of all, anyone uh, know what period this is in terms of you know, before the Bet Midrash, after the Bet Midrash, first, second, anyone any, have any uh, um, understanding of where, what period we're talking about? So the, the, the period that we're discussing is really the period of um, post first temple, first temple being destroyed, the 70 years after the first temple was destroyed, the Beit HaMikdash was already beginning to be built. Achashverosh comes into power and Achashverosh says, stop. I am not allowing the continuing building of the Beit HaMikdash. And he does everything in his power to make that happen. And in fact, later on, we find a common theme throughout the Megillah. Every time Achashverosh or Esther comes to Achashverosh for a request, he says something very strange. Yes, my queen, you can have whatever you want until halfway of my kingdom. What's that? Half, half? We're going to share? I'm the king, you're the queen, so I'll give you half. Rashi brings from the Gemara because at the halfway point was Yerushalayim. And Achashrosh knew one thing. I refuse to allow the Jewish people to have their sanctuary, to have their temple rebuilt and they can have that connection with God. So therefore, Esther, you can do whatever you want, I'll give you whatever you want, but there's one point I'm not going to let you do to allow the rebuilding of Beth Midash. Ironically, the whole story of an of, of the Purim miracle is that Achashverosh's own son, Baryavesh, from Esther, actually is the one who actually rebuilds the Beth Midash or gives permission to the Jews to rebuild and actually funds the entire Beth Midash from the coffers of the tax the taxes that his father, Hashrosh, actually collect. That's a fascinating twist on the whole story. God really shows uh, Hashrosh, you should just know, you, you've worked all your, your, your career to make sure the Beth Midash won't be built, but not only are you going to build it, you're going to pay for it as well. So, in terms of the economic status, the social status, and the political status, the Jewish people are after the, the temple was the first temple was destroyed. They've been 70 years in Galut, in Babel. They've been taken to Babylon, to Babylon, and they've been oppressed. They were taken in chains as prisoners. Really a kind of a quite a low morale where the Jewish people are at. And Mordechai is now in a position where he's not sure what to do. Why is that? Because on one hand, the Jewish people are, you know, downtrodden. They've got all sorts going on. They haven't been able to rebuild the ethnic dash. It's, it's really not happening from every level. And, and then suddenly this new guy, this prime minister comes in and he's starting to cause a little bit of problems. So Mordechai has got now two choices. Am I going to go ahead and put my foot down and say one second? Just because you think you can, you know, trample on us doesn't mean we have to be trampled. And we're not going to accept that. Or he can be of the position and say, listen, you think you can trample on us. And if we don't stand up, it's just going to get worse. And things are going to spiral out of control. Now, it takes a leader like Mordechai to recognize those signs. That, you know, the first time when Haman started, he didn't start off one day, okay, I'm just killing all the Jews. It, it was a slow process. But it was Mordechai who was alerting the Jews at every point, listen, guys, buckle up, wake up. And Mordechai in his position is saying, 
I'm not bowing down to you, Haman. Because what Haman wants to do is to take down the morale of the Jewish people. You are downtrodden. You're losers. You're nobodies. And you know what? We're going to kill you. And your blood's going to flow freely, freely on the streets. And no one will, will blink an eyelid. No one will, no one will care. And the UN will stand and do nothing. The world will stand and do nothing. I'll show you with the crystal nacht and nothing will happen. Which gives me more strength to do what I want. And Mordechai decided he's going to stick to his principles. I am not going to allow this kind of spiral effect to, to just take on. And I'm not going to um, subjugate the Jewish people to this kind of abuse. So Mordechai says, I'm going to stand up and by hook or by crook, I'm going to do what's right. Because if we don't do what's right, ultimately, it's just going to mess up. What Mordechai understood was that this whole process with Haman didn't come out of nowhere. You know, Mordechai himself, that he didn't bow down, was not the reason why Haman is killing the entire Jewish people or wants to kill the entire Jewish people. It's the excuse why he wants to use to be able to carry out his evil plans. Mordechai recognized that. Mordechai was able to appreciate that we've got to stand up to this, because if we don't, it's the end of the road. You may be able to kick the can down the road a month, a year, 10 years, but ultimately, this is the demise of the Jewish people. And therefore, Mordechai takes a very strong stand. He says, at my own risk of personal death, or the risk of the, the, the complete uh, obliteration of the entire Jewish people, I am going to stand up to Haman and say no. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing lesson in leadership in general for Mordechai to be able to, to stand up to that. It's a bit like what the recognition of Haman was, uh, of, of Mordechai, to appreciate what Haman was doing is almost like psychological warfare over here. Haman, you know, you know, they say about the Nazis, the Nazis tried to oppress the Jews in the camps to, you know, before the camps. It wasn't, didn't start in the camps. They, they, they make also the connection between the Nazis and the Egyptians. What they first do, first, you know, no Jews in the stores. Wear a yellow star, you're instantly recognizable. And then slowly, slowly, then crystal knife, then the cabs, then, you know, then you can do whatever you want, then, then the crematoriums. Because it starts one place and you need people to recognize, hey, this is a slippery slope. That was Haman's approach. And that's where Mordechai really takes a strong stand. Mordechai says, I am carrying the weight of the Jewish people. As a Gadol Israel, I am carrying the Shekhinah on my shoulders. I'm not going to bow down to, the, to Haman and his evil decrees, because this is Kavod Shammai. This is the, the, the godliness in this world can only be carried out if the Jewish people carry on. And therefore, he's going to do whatever it takes. So when it comes to something which is so critical, Mordechai is going to take this incredible stand and refuse to bow down against the king's orders to um, Haman. We asked about Esther. What's she doing? What does she want? She says to the, to the, uh, to the uh, rabbis, I want this for generations. What is she doing? So we asked before, what is this? She's going to her head. She wants to be, you know, front page of uh, the Time magazine. Is that what she wants? So let's make it that everybody remembers every year. And the answer is no, of course not. Because if, that was, if that's what she wants, then she'd be good enough with having it on in Malchei uh, Madar Paras, in the Chronicles of, of Media and Persia. But what Esther does in the Megillah is something very strange. She puts herself in a very negative light. If you look through the Megillah, have a look what Esther does. Mordechai comes up to the, the, the place of the king and she's not prepared to come with uh, appropriate... Oh, sorry, Mordechai is not allowed to come with sackcloth. So, they've heard about this terrible decree and everybody's crying, it's terrible. I don't know what's happening. 
Tzomu Bechi, we spared Sako Efi Yitzhak Arabim. It's really, really bad. And what's happening is, is Mordechai is not able to be able to... Sorry, one second. Someone's just at the door. Second. Hello? Yeah, Mark, one second. Um, so... Five minutes. Um, Mordechai is not in a position to be able to get the message across to Esther, but everyone knows, the Jews know, this is the end of the road. And Esther doesn't know anything about this. And Esther sent clothes to Mordechai and says, what's going on? And she sends Hatach, a trusted advisor, tell him what's going on. Hatach goes to Mordechai. You know, the whole concept of um, Mordechai being uh, stuck in this position where Haman's gone and, and basically bought the Jews and Jewish blood is now going to be running in the streets freely. And Esther doesn't know how to read this. And she says, well, okay, so uh, uh, what should I do? And, and Mordechai says, listen, you've got to go in. You've got to go in to the palace. And go into the king and beg for your life and for the life of your people. And Mar Esther sends back and says, I can't do this because I've never been called into the king. And you know, the king, he's, he's, a, he's a tyrant. And if he doesn't put out his scepter, I'm doomed. And I haven't been called to the king for 30 days. And then Mordechai says something so, so, you know, powerful. And Mordechai sent back a message to Esther. Do not imagine that you of all the Jews will escape with your life by being in the king's palace. You think you're safe over there? Guess what? On the contrary, if you keep silent in this crisis, you should know. Relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another quarter. God has a divine plan that the Jews will never, ever be eradicated. You can try whatever you want, but there will always be a Jewish nation. And you can try, and monarchs have tried, and generations have tried, and nations have tried, and no one's ever able to eradicate the Jewish people because God gave his vow. That will not happen. But, if you're not part of this relief plan, I can tell you, you and your father's house will perish. You think you're in the position of power now. How do you know that you're not in this position just for this point right now? God placed you literally to be able to do this. What's happening in the Megillah over here from this exchange is very clear. Esther is in a position of power, but she's not prepared to use it. She's painting herself in the reality, in real time, what happened. Esther did not live up to the challenge originally. Until Mordechai says, listen, if you think you're going to get around this and you're not going to do this, th don't worry. The Jews will get saved. You'll perish, not me, not us. But Esther is, is throwing this out over there and saying basically, you know, if, if you're trying to put yourself on the front page of the Time magazine or, or being interviewed by, a, by some sort of a journalist, you're going to paint yourself in the way history always portrayed themselves. History was always, you know, the the... the the people that won always painted history. Yeah, it was not the, the antagonist. You, you see that by, by Josephus, right? Josephus has his early account and his late account. And there's a lot of discrepancies because his early account was good with the Romans. And later on, kind of changes his, 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 uh, his whole tune. And suddenly, yeah, it wasn't so, the Romans weren't so great. And yeah, there was a lot of deaths on that side as well and all that sort of stuff. But the bottom line is, Esther is not looking great in this whole position. What's she doing? And Esther is saying to the rabbi, says, listen, I did not understand. I did not live up to the challenge. When I had to stand up for my principles and said, 
the Jewish people's blood is flowing like water. And I, listen, I, I need to self-survival. I don't know how to go about this. So maybe I'm not going to stand up and just, you know, I'll just let Haman kind of just wash over me. And that's what she tells the rabbi. She says, rabbis, I need you to understand that what needs to go for a few generations is this message, that Mordechai stood up to his principles. He stood up for what's right. And regardless of any ramifications, when it's right, you do it. What's going to happen? I don't know. But this message of God will always save us if we do what's right. That is the message which has to happen for future generations. I think it's such a powerful concept of, you know, understanding Mordechai's position, Esther's position. See how that whole thing kind of, you know, flows together and to appreciate that right and wrong when it's something which you appreciate, these are our principles, these are our values, this is our obligation. It doesn't make a difference what the ramifications are. This is what has to be done. You know, every person can make their own uh, uh, conclusions when it comes to stuff like Russia and Ukraine and stuff like that, and the world's, you know, supposed silence, and, you know, even the limited sanctions that there are. But in terms of we as Jews, well, how we have to feel how we have to look at a crisis, an existential crisis for, for, for so many people and say, one second, this is not okay. This is something which we have to stand up against. And this is something we have to stand for. What power do we have? It doesn't matter. Okay, we'll stop there.